You can't walk on water if you don't get out of the boat. Amen? Can't walk on water if you don't get out of the boat. Be in Mark chapter 6. You can stand with me if you will. We read God's Word together. Or I, or, or I read it for you. Straightway he constrained his disciples to enter into the boat and go before him and to the other side to Bethsaida. While he himself sended the multitudes away. And after he had taken leave of them, he departed into the mountain to pray. And when evening was come, the boat was in the midst of the sea. He alone on the land. Note this. Seeing them distressed and rowing, for the winds were contrary unto them, about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. But they, when they saw him walking on the sea, supposed that it was a ghost, and they cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled, but he straightway spake with them and said to them, Be of good cheer or courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And he went up unto them into the boat, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves. For they understood not concerning the loaves, because their hearts had been hardened. And when they were crossed over, they came to the land Gennesaret and moored to the shore. The word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Amen. And I, I bet you, go, go ahead and sit there. I bet you're already there. It's like, wait, 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 wait. You missed something, preacher. I know. I know. I know. Two-parter, part one. I'm going to get through the prelude. Part two, the walking on the water. Let me set this thing up. You know what I figured out? And it's taken me almost 30 years of ministry, but I'm, I'm cluing in, so uh, that's okay. Plan catch up. I can say what I need to say, but I don't have to say it all at one time. Amen? And so I realize today is communion, and I want to honor you, because sometimes I'm kind of one-dimensional. When my feet hit this pulpit, all that I want to do is share God's good news, Okay? And sometimes I can lose track of time, and, I, and I'm sorry about that. I, can't, I should say I can't help it. I probably could, but I want to share God's good news because I've been studying this stuff all week long, and, and I feel like I've got something to share, and God does too. And so sometimes I allow time to slip away from me. I don't want to do that today because I would rather break it up and give you God's good news in two parts than to shove it quickly to you and then time run out because communion, and we, we dishonor communion, and we never should, or the Word of God, and we never should. Is that okay? And so if you'll just, just stay with the story, let's walk up to this point. Let me give you a backstory. Backstory is this. King Herod, although he liked John the Baptist, John the Baptist started messing in his business. Remember the story? And he was married to his, really, his sister-in-law. And John the Baptist was given a, the privilege of coming before King Herod and preaching and sharing the word. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So John got in there and John goes, and the woman that you married to, mm, shame on you. And ooh, it made that woman mad. Amen. Made her mad. Y'all read the story, right? Made her mad. Made her real mad. But because he feared the people, he wasn't going to kill John. But because he feared his wife, he figured he might better do something. You know what I mean? All right, I'm just, well, I just want to be real about this thing now. <clears throat> so an opportunity presented itself sometime later because, again, God does not cover his stuff in his word. Amen? It's down and dirty. It's brutal. When you read the word of God, it talks true. Amen? So knowing how Herod was, how vile and how despicable of a human being he was, his daughter, daughter, came before him and danced the dance of the veils. We assume, we can't prove it, I wasn't there and neither were you. But danced the dance of the veils and it was a pretty seductive type of thing. And when he got through, he said, I'll give you anything you want. Up to, you know, I'll give you anything you want. And mama had already gotten to that baby girl first and said, I'll tell you what you do. You ask for John the Baptist's head on a plate, charger. And she did. And King Herod realized, uh-oh, I got me a problem. So he honored his word because he had to to save faith. So he, he took off John the Baptist's head. When that happened, it completely took the wind out of the sails of the disciples. We can understand that, right? I'm just talking straight, right? 
Ha- hasn't life taken the wind out of our sails sometimes? Amen? Haven't we had stuff happen to us that we just blindsided by life? Cancer is a dirty word, right? And, and, and other things happen too. And, and we, we get angry because we say this, but I'm a child of God. I mean, you're my father. You, you're not supposed to do this stuff to me. No, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that he would, the, the Bible does not promise that we, his children, will never suffer pain and troubles and trials and tragedies and tribulation. Does it? It doesn't say that at all. What it does say, however, is that no matter where life takes us, God is there with us. Amen? Isn't that true? Okay. And with that knowledge that no matter where life takes us, God is there with us, we can handle all things if we choose to. Remember that? If we lean on him and he'll give us strength and he'll give us everything we need, step by step, breath by breath, along life's pathway, till we get all the way home. Okay. But being... In human flesh and blood, it took the wind out of them. And Jesus, knowing that, they left to be alone, to gain their strength back, to gain their focus back, to get their heads and hearts back where it needed to. I understand that, and you do too. While they're out there involved in mission work, letting things kind of die down because it was pretty hectic around Jerusalem because when Herod did that, it created a whole bunch of difficulty. And had the disciples still been in Jerusalem, it probably wouldn't have been a bad, bad day. But nonetheless, they're away from it, out in Nazareth and in Gennesaret by the Sea of Galilee, okay, Capernaum, all that kind of stuff. While out there, we pick up another story. The story's about the feeding of the 5,000. So let me, let me, let me, let me kind of walk through this for the next just, just few minutes. You've got the killing of John the Baptist, right? You've got them out around the Sea of Galilee. The Bible says Bethsaida. There's a hill out around Bethsaida, a great big old hill, that can, that can hold a lot of folks. So there's 5,000 men, not counting women and children, because on that day, men sat one way, women and children sat the other way. I, was re- I, I came up in a Methodist church that way. You walked into that old church, men sat on one side, ladies and kids sat on the other side. The two didn't cross the aisle until at the church. I, I get that. And so the, there's 5,000 men, not counting women and children. There could have been 10 or 12, 15,000 people there, right? What happened? Remember what happened? Jesus looks out there and sees these people, and his heart is moved with compassion towards them. It's getting nighttime, and he says to Philip, already knowing what's going to take place, he says, so we need to feed them something. Philip is like, what? You read there, what? He said, even if we had eight months' wages, we couldn't feed this many people. There's no place to buy it. There's no place to get it. It ain't going to happen, Lord. We can't do it. In another gospel, one of the disciples spoke up and said, but, oh, I like that. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I do. But, oh, Lord, we have found a young lad. He has five loaves Two small fishes. Remember that story? Okay, let's, let's park on that. You've got this hillside. You've got these people. You've got these people that need help, need healing, need hope, need encouragement. Disciples do too. Amen? I mean, wouldn't you need it if, if, if John, John before Jesus, right? John was their mentor, not Jesus. Jesus came later down the road, but John had been around for a long time preaching and proclaiming God's good news. They were led to Jesus through John, right? Okay. And so when John was taken away, Jesus is still there, but that's not good enough at the moment because of the pain in their heart because of the one that they loved, okay? And so that, there's a lot to be dealt, and there's a lot going on, and to be quite frank with you, they're discouraged. Ever been discouraged? Oh, yeah. Ever been disillusioned in church? Oh, yeah. Ever been depressed, discouraged, disillusioned, doubtful? Have you ever doubted God? Have you ever had life swing at you so hard and hit you so hard that you doubted God's ability to see you through? Know where I'm coming from? Them too. And so this, this story is set in the three Gospels. And it's set there for a purpose. It sets us up for the rest of the story. And so there's 5,000 people, not counting men and, men and women, and they're on this, in, on this mountaintop. Jesus walks up, and there ain't nothing to give them. And then Jesus says, will you feed them? Me, my tank's empty, Lord. I can't, even, I can't even help myself. You ever been there? I'm hurting, Lord. I'm struggling, Lord. I'm angry, Lord. I'm upset, Lord. I'm discouraged, Lord. I'm depressed, Lord. I'm disillusioned, Lord. Nothing's going right, Lord. I'm empty, Lord. How can I help anybody? I cannot even help myself. Have you ever been there? Then you get it, right? 
And so there they stand, and they're looking at each other. I'm thinking with eyes wide open and mouth hanging down, thinking, what? What can we do? We don't have any food. We don't have any means. We don't have any money. We, we can't do this. It's too big, Lord. It's too great. It's too massive. We cannot do this until the child shows up. What do we see here? What do we see? Let me give you three things, then we'll unpack it later on. Let me just give you three things. When faced with a problem, see what you got. When faced with a problem, an obstacle, an overwhelming thing in life, see what you got. When they looked around, they said, we can't do this, Lord. But, love the but, but a child, a child, that's put in there for a reason. A child has a lunch, has five loaves, two small fishes. See what you got. You know how, you, you know how they knew? Somebody found the child, amen? I, I don't imagine he just, well, I don't think he did that. They found that child. God's good at leading, isn't he? Found the child. Child was asked, I would assume, would you be willing to share? Isn't that good too? What have you got? If you have nothing else to give him but your anger and bitterness, give it to him. I bet he can use it to build you and build us too. If you've got a gift, share it. I bet he can use it. See what you've got. What have you got? What have you got this morning you can give to Jesus? Have you got nothing else? Like the little kid in the offering plate. He just came to Jesus, offering place being passed up and down, up and down. He turned to the asked his daddy, what are they doing? Taking up the offering, what are they doing that for? To give back to God what God has given to us. He said, I ain't got nothing. And, and the dad just blew him off. The offering plate's going, the kid's watching, getting closer and closer, hearts thud, 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 thud. Little kid gets there and it gets to his hand, you know what little kid does? Little kid takes the offering plate, steps out, puts it on the floor, and said, I don't have no money, but can I give me? Oh, man. <laughs> Amen. I don't have any money, but can I give me any steps in the offering plate? You know what we need to do? A whole bunch of us probably need to step into the aisle and get the offering plate and step into it. Amen? And maybe you don't have a lot, but what have you got? Remember last week? Not much but enough. What you got? See what you have. They found this child that had five loaves, two small fishes. Give what you got. See what you have. Give what you got. Share what you've been given. Okay? See what you have, give what you got, share what you've been given. See what you've got, give what you have, share and use what you've been given. If we do these things, these three things, I bet you God can use every one of us somewhere, somehow. Amen? Amen. And so there's the story for just a moment, then we'll pass on. Then after this, after this story of the 5,000, see what you have, give what you got, use and share what you've been given. Jesus already knows what he's going to do. I like this part. And so he says, you guys get in the boat and head for Capernaum across the water. Okay. And I'll, I'll send everybody home. So he sends everybody home. Then when these disciples get into the boat and they start rowing, you call that, right? They're rowing. It's a rowboat. Big boat, but they're rowing. That ain't easy. Have y'all ever seen pictures of these boats? They're great big old ugly things. They're not easily to be handled. And so they're kind of top heavy and they're kind of wide, kind of long. They got at least three sets of oars, two men oars, three on one side, three on the other side, depending on the size and the shape of the ship. But generally speaking, that's how they were. So you've got at least 12 disciples, right? Two, four, six, two, four, six, twelve. So I'm thinking, I could be wrong. But I'm thinking that everybody has a place, right? Everybody has a place. Everybody's sitting down. They didn't row that way looking front. They rode this way looking backwards, okay? They're looking backwards. Looking at where they've been, not where they're going. Because you got somebody steering this thing. Or man, oh, Okay. So they get in this boat, and here they go. Rowing. <laughs> rowing, rowing, rowing. When they get out about three and a half or four miles, a wind comes sweeping through those valleys off that mountaintop and drops on that water quickly, suddenly, immediately, and it turns that water into a tempestuous basin. I mean, it's, it's sloshing water around like in a, in a bowl, in a fish bowl, and so water's just sloshing, the boat's rocking, and I mean, it's nasty, it's bad, it's, it's difficult and dangerous. I'd remind you of two or three things. First of all, this, Jesus put them there, amen? We say, you know what? Why me? Why this? Why now? God must be mad at me. I'd remind you, God put them in the ship, God sent them in the sea, and God knew about the storm, okay? 
So if God puts you in the ship and sends you on the sea and brings the storm, don't you think he'll see you through? He will. But they didn't know that because they're discouraged, depressed, disillusioned, and all this kind of stuff. So they get in this ship, they're out there, and about halfway through, they're rocking and rolling on life's sea, and they're getting nowhere fast. It is really brutal, really ugly. Can I help you here and you help me? It's at nighttime, right? So the moon was probably not shining because there's a storm raging, right? Probably dark. And yet it says this, he saw them. Remember that? He saw them on the sea, in the storm, toiling, working, struggling, and getting nowhere. About the fourth watch, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, watch number 1. 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, watch number 2. Uh, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, watch number 4. 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, uh, 3. Then 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, watch number 4. Somewhere around 3 o'clock in the morning, he started walking on the water. Oh, I like. How long have they been in the sea? Six hours? Am I right? Somewhere like six hours? They've been out of there for a long time. What they've been doing, they've been struggling. How come? Because Jesus put them there. Why? We'll get there maybe this week or next week. So they're struggling in their own life, see, and it's looking bad fast. And then Jesus sees them, Jesus sees them, and Jesus waits. Let's part there for a minute. Have, ever, have you ever felt alone on life, see? Has your boat ever been rocked on life, see? Have you ever struggled on the waters? Have you ever felt that you were going to sink? Have you ever felt that God didn't care? Have you ever felt that God wasn't listening? Have you ever felt all alone? Bet they did. I remind you, God sent them, God put them in the boat, sent them on the sea, and watched them in the storm. About three o'clock in the morning after they've been rowing for a long, long time, doing all they could to get out of this mess that they found themselves in, God started walking on the water. Why the storm? Why the storm? Let me offer some suggestions here. Why the storm? Maybe it tests the nature of our faith. Maybe it tests the nature of our faith. What kind of, what kind of faith do you have? Just asking. You say, oh, Lord, I got strong faith. When's the last time you was in a storm? Amen. It doesn't matter what you think. Doesn't matter what you've been told. You don't know what you've got until you get on the storm. Then you find out real quick what you're made out of. Amen? You and me and us. And so sometimes storms come to test the nature of our faith. Do we really trust Jesus? Or are we rowing as hard as we can, hoping and praying to get out of the mess that we're in? Hmm. It may be that storms come to test the strength of our commitment. We say, I'm there, brother. I got you back. Really? Do you now? When storms come, we have to prioritize ourselves, don't we? When storms come, sometimes we lose commitment and the strength of that commitment. Oh, I'd like to, but. I want to, but. I wished I could, but. Sometimes storms come to test the nature of our faith. Sometimes storms come to test the strength of our commitment. Sometimes storms come to test the level of our maturity. Are you a full-grown Christian? And call yourself that? Okay. How, how mature are you? We demonstrate maturity in storms. We demonstrate maturity in stress. We demonstrate maturity in life's sea. We demonstrate maturity in our actions, attitudes, and activities. We demonstrate maturity in a lot of ways. Most of them are public, not private. I'm reminded of, a, of an Andy Griffith, uh, Griffith episode I saw a long time ago and tried that thing out. You remember the one where Opie had a friend that was a spoiled, rotten little youngin? And Opie decided he'd test his daddy out, so he launched himself out and just started having a temper tantrum. Remember that one? Just kicking and crying and screaming and yelling and all that kind of stuff. And Andy watched him and picked him up and, and kind of settled that thing. Yeah, me too. So I tried that out one day. I threw myself out in the middle of the floor because my mama told me to do something. And I kicked and I screamed and I had myself a time until she reached down there and grabbed me by the back of my neck and the seat of my pants. And we did the dance of doom in the, in the living room. You don't know, remember that? When I heard that belt come out of that slip, 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 slip. And I looked over there, and I saw the look on my mama's face, and I saw the belt in her hand. I realized I had made a sad, sad mistake. Assumptions will kill you, won't it? 
So sometimes we are tested by storms. The nature of our faith, strength of our commitment, level of our maturity, health of our attitude, and measure of our teachability. Can you be taught or do you think you know everything? Are you willing to receive or do you just want to tell everything? Are you willing to be taught by God, whether you like to be taught or not? Do you want to be taught by God, care about being taught by God, wish to be taught by God? Do you want to know more about God, know more about yourself, know more about others? Do you want that? You'll have storms sometimes to teach you and show you, to allow you the privilege of saying, you know, I could be wrong. To allow you the privilege to say, well, maybe that's a, that's a, that's a great idea. Sometimes storms come for a lot of reasons, not just because of sin. Sometimes God has a point in the storm. Let me stop on this one. What kind of storms are there? It could be a storm of correction, a wake-up call. It could be a storm of confirmation. It builds character. It could be a storm of reproduction. We learn to imitate Christ. There's no oil without pressing. There's no juice without squeezing. There's no fragrance without crushing. There's no real joy without sorrow. Amen? It is amen. So Jesus prays for us. What does he pray? He prays that our faith won't fail. He prays that we won't give up. And he prays that we won't turn back. I don't know where you are this morning. I have absolutely no idea. I don't know what's going on in your life. I have absolutely no idea. But it may be you're in a storm. It may be you're fixing to be in a storm. It may be all kinds of things. Looking on the horizon, thanking God you've been through it. Looking on the horizon, th hoping to God you don't get in it. Or hoping to God you get out of it. You've been in it. You're going to be in it. You are in it. Okay? And it may be wherever you are that God is trying to teach us and teach you and all that. And so may I offer to you God's gift of word, word of God speak. Wherever it is you are, receive instruction. Whatever God's gift to you is, receive the gift. Whatever it is that God wants to do for you and for me and for us, for others and for him, allow it to be, O oh Lord, allow it to be. You can't walk on water if you don't get out of the boat, part two. This will be from Matthew 14. You can stand with me if you want to. Matthew 14. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Don't be afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, coming towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, and he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, caught him, saying, you, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. The Word of God for the people of God. Amen. You can be seated. Let me, let me catch us up real quick before we, we get into the, the, the morning message. You can't walk on water. You can't walk on water if you don't get out of the boat. Everything I'm going to say over the next 22 or 23 minutes has this underpinning, this foundation. We see God way too little, don't we? We see God too little. And when we see God too little, we don't trust him, do we? We doubt. We think that our problems are so big, so big, God couldn't possibly deal with them. Or, we think we're so insignificant that why should God even bother? Is that true? I'm just asking. You, you, you don't have to answer. But in your heart, you know it's true. 
we believe at least those two things that we are so insignificant because we've got such a low value and esteem because we've been told by society and by other things you're nothing that everything around us just it just happened by evolution about whatever it means that science says that it does and I'm not knocking science I, I dig science I like science and when we believe that, that we came from animals or some just happenstance, some accident, some cosmic whatever way back whenever it was, and we just evolved into what we are and hopefully one day we'll evolve into something a whole lot better. When we see ourselves that way, that there's no, there's no relational thing in God to ourselves, when we devalue this creation, this masterpiece of God, when we see ourselves through the lens that says you're nothing but dirt and dust, when we see ourselves that way, we act that way, we, dis, we dishonor and devalue God too, don't we? And when we say that, God, you don't know, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm going through. You can't possibly understand how I feel. You can't possibly understand how I feel when the nearest and the dearest to me is dead or dying. You don't know how I feel when my kids are going astray. You don't know how I feel when, when work or money or whatever the way you want to throw that into the slot fix for you, for me, and for others. You say you don't know. And so this scripture is in here for us, whoever you may be this morning. I'd remind you that it's been a bad, bad day, been a bad week and a bad month. John, their, their beloved John had been murdered by King Herod. And King Herod did it to save face in front of his friends. And so it says in Matthew in particular, when Jesus heard about this, he gathered, gathered up his core, his disciples, and they went to a desert place. They went to a, a far place. They went away to the Sea of Galilee, Sea of Genesaret, if you will. And as they gathered themselves there, everybody saw them leave it, and they came to him. And it was, a, it was a big deal, man, because they knew about Jesus, and they were hopeless and hurting people, and they needed a touch from on high. So those that were deaf and those that were lame and those that were uh, mute and those that were demon-possessed and those that were broken and wounded and fractured and hurting people from all around that area, they came in mass to Jesus where he was and where they were. I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking, wouldn't you be irritated if you were the disciples? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you say, come on now. I, I, we don't need any more trouble. We got enough. They've been beat down. I mean, hey, I mean, if, if God loves, if God's love is manifested into the death of John, and you say God loves us, I don't get that. I don't get how you can kill John and say God loves him. I don't get how you can give me grief and misery and say you love, I don't get that. And so the disciples have not yet learned some valuable lessons, and they won't for a long time. They're still trying as we are, right? You still, we're still growing in Jesus, right? I, I've been in this thing 30 years. I, I'm, I'm trying to grow too because I still have those conversations with Jesus, don't y'all? I'm, I'm just asking. I'm not being smart. I mean, but don't y'all? Don't you ask God, how come? Why me? Why this? Why now? Don't y'all have those conversations? Sure you do. And so they're no different than we are, although they walked in the presence of the Almighty. They, they, they saw the stuff. But they're, 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 the, the winds have been taken out of their selves, and they are, they're just they're struggling, man. They're struggling. And so Jesus does something marvelous, something absolutely unexpected. He says, y'all come on in. Y'all come on in. And so 5,000 men, not counting women and children, could have been as much as 10, maybe 12,000 people gathered up. And he turns to one of his disciples because he knows where his heart and head is. And he says, so what you going to feed them? I say, what? What do you mean feed them? If everybody gave all they had, we, we, we could not begin to feed this amount of people. Have you lost your mind? We send them home, Jesus. Send them. Isn't that what we do? I'm just asking again. I'm, not, I'm, 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 just, I'm just talking to you. When problems come our way because people look at us and they say, you go to church, right? Mm-hmm. I go to church. And so they assume that you really believe what you say you believe, don't they? And they come to you with all of life's problems and difficulties, expecting some good news from us to them who are hurting, but we're hurting so bad ourselves. We don't always have good news, do we? And what we want is for God to get rid of this problem, to move it on down the road of peace. So here they are. And then Jesus says, you feed them. Thank God for one. Philip, I believe it says. Philip says, you know, we, we can't feed them, but you know what I feel? 
I found me a little fella here that's got five barley loaves and two small fishes. And he brought it. And he invested it. And God used it. Remember what I said last week? The message, at least for, for, for this morning, see what you've got, bring what you have, and use what you've been given. Amen? See what you have. Use what you've got and share what you've been given. And so God shares himself in this story. And 5,000 men, maybe ten or 12,000 people were filled to the full. And 12 baskets remained. After that, Jesus said, uh, y'all get in the ship. Y'all get on the sea. And I'll catch you in just a little bit. And so no sooner had they gotten the ship and got about three miles, three and a half, four miles out in the middle of this thing, storm broke. Have y'all ever been on the water when a storm came out? I got three years offshore. I love helicopters. What's a love-hate relationship? I jumped helicopters off the back end of ships for a long time. And, and, and that's cool. But when you got a little bitty ship on a great big ocean and the ocean gets mad at you and you start bobbing around like a cork, it ain't fun. When we were out there sometimes, you could see the, you know, those great big old carriers, when the screws come out of the water, that ain't a good day for us. Because we're bobbing like a cork out there, and it's a bad, bad day. I don't like seas and storms, you know what I mean? And so they're out there in this little bitty boat, probably three to a side, uh, two men or oars. So you got two, four, six, two, four, six, twelve guys. Everybody's got an oar. Everybody's giving it all they got. Not looking that way, looking that way, where they've been, not where they're going, because they don't care where they're going. <laughs> they're just rowing, rowing, rowing. And so they're out in the middle of the sea, and it says that Jesus in the fourth night, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, watch 1, 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, watch 2, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, watch 3, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, watch 4. Sometime between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning in the fourth watch, Jesus seeing them on the water begins walking to them. Isn't that good news? Now, come on now. Isn't that good news? Jesus, I remind you before we get where we're going, Jesus put him in the boat, didn't he? Come on now. Jesus put him in the boat. Jesus put him on the water. And Jesus put him in the storm. Ain't that right? Put him in the boat. Put him on the water. Put him in the storm. What does that tell you about Jesus? Some of us would say, he don't love us like he says he does. Have you ever been put in the boat? And have you ever been put on the water? And have you ever been placed in the storm? Remember what we're saying? How come storms come? Storms come to test us, don't they? Sometimes it tests our resolve. Sometimes it tests our commitment. Sometimes it tests our maturity. Sometimes it tests us. I'll give you a shot here. I was scared of the water. Absolutely scared to death of the water. And etched in my mind until I lose my mind is this scene. I wanted to learn how to swim, but I'm scared of the water. So I'm out by the, by the creek bank, by the water one day, and my mom was there, and she's scared of the water too, and I think she rubbed off on me because I'm scared of the water. And my daddy walks by, and, and, and I'm saying, I want to learn how to swim. Well, get out there. Mm-mm. Well, mm-mm. You know what my daddy did? I'm like six years old, I'm thinking. He picked me up, and he does this number. And he threw me. Can you believe? Threw me now. You know how the mind does this thing? As I see myself floating through the air, I look back and I see my mama's face. Ah, you know? I see my daddy's grin. I see my brother like, yeah. And I see all this stuff going around. Then I turn and I see the water and I'm thinking, you know, that's going to be cold and that's going to hurt. And I hit it. And it was cold and it did hurt. You know what I did? Struggling though I was, I bobbed, I, I popped up like a cork and I was grabbing me some water, man. I mean, I was just, I mean, have, and you know what I did? I was dog paddling, you know what I mean? I was dog paddling for the world, man. It might not have been pretty. I was struggling, but you know what? I didn't drown. You know what that taught me? Sometimes God will throw you in the storm and you will go under, but you won't go down. Amen? You, 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 when God puts you on the boat and puts you on the water and puts you in the storm, don't you think God knows what he's doing? We say no. God does. Let's get to the story this morning, man. As, as the storm is raging around them and water is flooding that boat and they are rocking on the sea of life, if you will, and they are scared, slammed to death, 
And I promise you that everybody's doing the same thing. They praying and they rowing as hard as they can and they get nowhere fast. And somebody looks up and sees this apparition. Now, my thoughts, again, it's my thoughts. You can take it for whatever it's worth. Since John had just been murdered, my thoughts are they see John coming. Because it's a ghost. And they're freaking out. How did they see him? I don't think this is just the Shekinah glory God was on Jesus. I think the moonlight or something caught a flash of this apparition walking on the water, and they're, they're scared to death. And so they're rowing, 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 and they look and they see this thing, and it's like, oh, my. And they're scared. And then they hear a voice, and this voice is the voice of Jesus. It says, what are you scared of? It's me. What are you scared of? Isn't that how we react? We're rowing, rowing, rowing. We're on storms, and it's raging. The, the sea up under us is tossing and turning. And we're scared to death, and we look up, and we don't want to be there, and we look up, and we don't see Jesus. We see some apparition, and we are scared to death. And then if we listen, we hear in the midst of the storm, the raging sea, we hear a small, still voice that shatters the silence of our soul and dispels the fears that we have, and it says, it's me. What are you scared of? But, Peter says, if it is you, bid me come walk on the water. I want to go back there in a minute, but let's just pass it on by for a second. Let's ask some questions. I, I think they're valid. How come they didn't get out of the boat? How many, let's, let's see if we can play. They 12 of them on the boat at least, right? At least 12 of them. One got out of the boat, right? Peter. Peter got, now let's just stop for a second. Peter got out of the boat. You hear me? Got out of the boat and he's walking on water. Have you ever tried walking on water? It don't work too good, but we'll leave that for a second. He heard the verse of Je he heard the voice of Jesus in the midst of the raging sea and storm. He heard the voice of Jesus say to him, if nobody else, what you scared of? It's me. What you scared of? It's me. And Paul requested from God a miracle. Let me come to where you are. Isn't that good? Let me come to where you are. He's coming to where I am, but let me come to where your faith. So he steps out of the boat onto the raging sea, and he's walking above and on the situation, the circumstances of his life, coming to Jesus. But my question is, what about the rest of them cats? How come they, get, how come they didn't get out of the boat? Now, here's what we do. We make a big deal of, of Peter going down, don't we? You ask somebody, tell me about that walking on the water thing. Yeah, but you know what? Peter went down. Well, wait a minute now. Isn't that the wrong perspective? We always go for the negative, don't we? We always go for the bad stuff. We don't see, we don't think about it, but he walked on water. He walked on water. What we, what, we, what we focus in on is that he went under the water. But thank God God caught him. But why didn't the rest of them walk on the water? Why didn't the rest of them get out of the boat? Why did they stay in the boat? Good question. Could it be because they're too busy rowing? I'm just asking. Could it be they're too busy rowing? When you're in the midst of the storm, what are you thinking about? Walking on water or rowing and keeping your head above water? I'm just asking. Aren't we thinking about rowing and keeping our head above water? Aren't we thinking about ourselves and our situation? Aren't we thinking about doing everything we can at the moment in the situation just to survive? Isn't that how we mostly and normally think? Isn't it? Of course it is. So why didn't they get out of the boat? Maybe it is there's too busy rowing. Maybe they didn't have faith. You say, now, Brother Lynn, I mean, we're talking about walking on water. I got that. But I'm just thinking. If he's walking on the water and I belong to him, why can't I? You know what I'm saying? Why can't I? If he can make the dead rise, how come I can't walk on water? If he can make demons run, how come I can't walk on water? If he can make blinded eyes see and mute ears, uh, deaf ears hear and mute tongues speak, if he can do all that kind of stuff, how come I can't walk on water? Why didn't they? Too busy rowing. Why didn't they? Not enough faith. Why didn't they? Distorted view of God. How big's your God? Come on now. How big is your God? If you have a relationship that does this, he's my great big old fella. He's my buddy. Uh-oh. <laughs> we got a problem. If you see God like you see yourself, we got a problem, Houston. 
If you see God a little bitty, you got a problem. If you see God like one of the buddies, you got a problem. And I got a problem. If we see God small and we see God impotent and we see God powerless and we see God self centered if we see God like we see ourselves, we got ourselves a big, big problem. So maybe they didn't get out of the boat because they rowing too hard. Maybe they didn't get out of the boat because they didn't have enough faith. Maybe they didn't get out of the boat because, to be quite frank with you, they'd rather be in a sinking ship than a raging sea. Amen? They'd rather be in a sinking ship than a raging sea. Maybe it's because they're comfortable. Uh-oh. Excuse me for a minute. Remember when I first came here what I said? I'm going to make you mad at me because I'm going to push, push, push. Amen? I'm going to challenge because I see God real big. How about you? I don't believe in can't. I believe in should. Don't you? I'm not being smart about this thing. But don't you want more than you got? If you, if, if you keep on getting what you already got and you don't like it, shouldn't we change the equation somehow? Shouldn't we? And so if you don't like what you've got, change the equation. If you think your God's too little, change the equation. If you want to see God move like he's never moved before, why don't we see God as great big, not little bitty? If we do that, when we do that, I'm promising you, from God's good news, God will do stuff that you have never in your life believed he could or would do because my God can do anything. So let's ask the other question. How come Peter got out of the boat? That's some, opportunity, that's some possibilities why they didn't, but how come he did? Could it be that he, he recognized the voice and the storm? Didn't Elijah do that? I'm just asking. Remember Elijah, the story of Elijah? Great big old fire. You know, I just don't see God in that. Great big old earthquake. Don't see God in that. Then a small, still voice asked a probing question. Elijah, what are you doing in there? Uh-oh. What are you doing here? What are you doing in there? Where are you? What are you doing? What are you doing here? Aren't those probing questions? On life's tempestuous sea, storm winds howling, seas raging, on a rocking, reeling boat, and God asks the question, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? That's awesome. He got out of the boat because I believe he heard and recognized the voice of his master saying, come to me. Maybe he got out of the boat because he recognized and realized previous victories. Maybe for a moment he really did remember the feeding of the 5,000. Can I, can I, let me just play with it for a second. How did he do that? How did he do that? We talking five barley loaves and two little bitty fishes. It ain't sushi <laughs> and it ain't dough. He created fish and bread, loaves of bread that fed a multitude. How did he do that exponentially increasing? All this stuff. How he did that is because he's the God that, is, that created all things. And all things and everything from, from, from the subatomic level, from the microscopic level, all the way up, all that is and all that ever shall be is under his control and subject to his command. And so when God wanted bread and fish, God got bread and fish. Amen? Don't you think he can do that for you? Don't you think that my God and your God and our God is big enough to turn our stuff into opportunities, our obstacles into opportunities to marvel in his power and marvel in his majesty? Don't you think our God is big enough to do anything with what we've got and flip that thing over and bring honor and glory to his name, to his church? Come on now. He did it here. Why did he walk on water? He recognized the voice of his master. Why did he walk on water? For a moment, for a fleeting moment, he remembered that God did this marvelous, miraculous thing. Fed 5,000 just by the power of his spoken word. I need me some bread and I need me some fish. Boom. There it is. They reached in, they got, they reached in, they got, they reached in until everybody got full and they got full. There's 12 baskets left over. That ain't bad. How come he walked on water? He could release his present fears. Everybody else is saying, I ain't getting out of the boat. Have you seen the winds? Have you seen the seas? Are you crazy? Have you lost your cotton picking mind? Ever had anybody say that? You know what? I'll give you a shot here. Here's what I believe. 
that there's a verse there's a lot of them that says this wait I say wait on the Lord that Hebrew word wait means this picture a picture when the storms are raging around you you got some little fellow standing there saying yeah I hear the winds and yeah I see the seas but you know what I hear my Jesus and I don't care about the wind and I don't care about the sea because I heard my Jesus and I don't understand it and I don't like where I am but bless God I'm gonna tell you one thing I'm gonna do I'm gonna stay right where I am till he comes gets me or I get him amen wait upon the Lord and he will renew our strength amen wait upon the Lord and he will manifest himself to you wait upon the Lord and he'll come where you are wait I say on the Lord and so Peter believed and Peter uh, cast aside his fears. He requested help. Lord, bid me come. Whew. Lord, bid me come. Mm, mm, mm. He was focused for a moment, but then he faltered in his faith and he began to sink. But thank God, God can catch you. God, God, God's a good catcher. When he went down, God got him. Amen. When he's began to... Have you ever sunk... Have you ever walked on the water for a moment, but then you started taking in water and you went down for the count, you thought? And in that moment of fear and desperation for a lack of a... You cried out, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. And he does, doesn't he? He always has. And he always will. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing, amazing thing. We say, how could God do that? Mari from uh, Louis Giglio for a minute here. Think about our God. Think about our God. In the Psalms and in other places it says this, the heavens shout out your glory. Amen? What is, what is man that thou art... When I look into the wonders of the heavens and the canopy above... When I walk up and look up and I see scattered in the vastness of emptiness, and when I see out there prickles and pinpoints of light, when I see all the marvelous wonders that are placed to the canopy of the heavens, everything I see shouts out. Yeah, I done that. Bad English, but truth nonetheless, I did that. Our Milky Way galaxy is a hundred thousand light years across 186,000 miles per second light travels yes remember your math remember your science 186,000 miles per second light travels if you could start on this end of the Milky Way our little bitty galaxy our little bitty galaxy and you could go for a hundred thousand years at 186,000 miles per second you'd hit the other side is that big? Is that big? That's huge. And the Bible says that I know all the stars by name. Our scientists tell us because of the Hubble telescope, we are one small portion of God's magnificent masterpiece of creation. And scattered out in the vastness of space, thanks to the Hubble telescope, we know this. We are one among tens of billions of stars. Help me here. Tens of billions of stars. And around every star is a galaxy, right? But, but every star has something floating around it. Our sun is a star. It has planets around. Tens of billions of stars. Tens of billions of galaxies. Tens of billions. And he knows every one of them by name. And yet, the Bible says, he can number the hairs on my head. <laughs> oh, well. He can number the hairs of my head. He knows me by name. Does that tell you something about Jesus? Does that tell you something about our God? That although God flung it all out there and he did it for one reason... So that we would be reminded not how big we are nor how little we are, but it reminds us of God's creative masterpiece creation. And when we look out there upon that starry canvas of heavens, we are reminded that God is big enough to handle my problems. And God loves me enough that although he knows every star by name, he knows my name. Do you realize you're a unique creation? Do you realize that? 
that if I understand and remember my, my, my science, that a mama had 23 chromosomes, daddy had, is it 46 maybe, whatever it is. Y'all have to help me later on. But mama had half, daddy had half, and they met. Hallelujah. And when they met, one cell, one cell started creating according to the, genetic, to the genetic code of God, that God said that you're marvelously and wonderfully made, that God knew who you would be before you ever got here. And God is placed into the fingerprint of his own created masterpiece who you are and who you're going to be. Don't you think that tells you something about God? Let me tell you something. I know I ain't much, but I'm glad I am what I am. Amen? I'm glad I am what I am because God loves me so much that he called me by name before I ever got here. He knew I would be, and he has given me the privilege of being part of his kingdom and part of his wish and will and work. Amen? And so I'm telling you, when you get put in the boat and you get put upon the water and you get put in the storm, big deal. Big deal. Because if you can look beyond the winds and you can look beyond the waves and you can look beyond the water, you're going to see walking on top of every bit of it, not God, my daddy. My daddy. And my daddy loves me, he won't let me drown. My daddy loves me so much, he won't let me go down from the camp because that's how God is, isn't it? And so when you start feeling blue and you feel like God doesn't love you, or doesn't care about you, I got something to tell you here. Take a look up and take a look out because everything out there reminds us, my God's big. <laughs> My God's bigger than my present, bigger than my past, and a whole lot bigger than my future. And my God loves me so much that although he created all that, he created me too. And he died on an old rugged cross to give me the hope and the privilege of one day being part of his family. Isn't that cool? Come on, man. Come on. Come on. Do you know that you know that you're saved? Well, bless God, I do. Do you know, if you die right here, right, if God closes off your breath and you die right here, right now, you know you're going up? I do. And you know what? Because I know I'm going up, ain't a doubt in my mind. You know what that does? It gives me strength. It gives me hope. It gives me strength because I ain't scared anymore. I'm not being smart. I ain't scared no more. I'm not scared of life and I ain't scared of death. Got scars all over me and you do too, don't you? Been in a fight, been in for a long, long time. I got scars all over me, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. But you know what I know through every trouble, every trial, and every tragedy? You know what I know? <laughs> I know my God loves me. I know my God loves me. And because of that, I'm going to praise his name. <laughs> I'm going to praise him. And I'm going to shout as long as I've got breath and as long as I've got opportunity. I'm going to shout, glory be to his name. Amen.